You wired me awake and hit me with a hand of broken nails. With this month's release of Prey from Arkane Studios, which is a fine game but one that, despite its name, has very little to do with the original Prey that we played back in 2006, it felt like the perfect time to investigate a game that unfortunately we never got our hands on. I'm talking about the true sequel to that original Prey, Prey 2, and by the sounds of it, it had a lot of potential. You may well have already seen the trailer and the gameplay demo shown at E3 back in 2011, but in this week's episode of Here's a Thing, we'll be revealing for the first time the game's big plot twist and potential ending, the narrative links to the first Prey, and a number of unannounced features that were being worked on. I'd like to give a big thank you at this stage to all the people that spoke to me about their work on Prey 2 over the last few weeks, you can see their names here, because, yeah, all these years later, despite having moved on to different studios and new projects, they each lit up when talking about this game and its ambitions. However, I should point out that these were not the only people I approached about this piece, given the legal nature of what happened between the developer Human Head Studios and the publisher Bethesda, not everyone felt comfortable talking about this project, even now. If you are interested in that side of the story, we're going to be running a piece about that specifically on Eurogamer tomorrow. And yeah, it's messy and it's frustrating and it's about more than just this one game. But that's not what today's video is about. Here we're talking about what Prey 2 could have been had it made it all the way to release. So yes, you'll perhaps know some of this already. The sequel would have put you in the shoes of a brand new character called Killian Samuels, a US Marshal transporting a prisoner on this plane right here, as in yes, the one that crashed into the sphere in Prey 1. The game would begin with you fighting your way out of its wreckage before being knocked out and waking up stranded on an alien planet called Exodus. The story then jumps ahead by about a decade, in which time Killian, thinking himself to be the only human on the planet, has taken on the role of a bounty hunter. And that was the pitch for Prey 2 pretty much from the start, I'm told, an open world bounty hunter game set in an alien noir cityscape. The studio wasn't initially that concerned with having all that many connections between the first Prey and this new game they were working on because they would play so differently. However, that did change over the course of its development. In fact, there was going to be one very big crossover between these two games. It turns out Killian isn't the only human on Exodus. Tommy is there as well, the protagonist from the first game, although he'd only communicate with you initially using his spirit form because his body is trapped by some unknown enemy. And as part of the main thrust of the storyline, you'd eventually free him and together discover that the entire planet was secretly being controlled by the Keepers, the true enemy of Prey. They're busy building another sphere, this one's called the War Sphere, so you know it's bad, and they're planning to use it to attack Earth, which means obviously you and Tommy need to destroy it. That's the end game. But let's talk about the big plot twist that happens along the way. Interestingly, Bethesda's marketing team wasn't crazy about this idea. They thought it'd be too confusing for players to understand, but let's see what you make of it. When you meet Tommy for the first time, your character, Killian, believes just that, that this is the first time the two of them have ever met. But this isn't the case. No, instead, you eventually find out that every time your character has died and then respawned in his safe house, which was heavily, heavily inspired by Dakar's apartment from Blade Runner, by the way. Look at these comparison shots. Yeah, every time you respawn there, Killian's consciousness is actually being transferred to a new clone of himself. And remember we said that the story had jumped forwards by about 10 years after the plane crash? Well, during that time period, Killian has died hundreds upon hundreds of times, only to wake up once more in his apartment. And for some reason, he doesn't remember that. The full extent of this cycle is revealed towards the end of the game, as you fight your way through the war sphere itself and reach an area littered with dozens of Killian's former bodies stacked up against the doorway. Your past selves had worked with Tommy countless times before now, it seems, and this is the furthest they'd ever reached. Yes, that sounds horrific, but what a great plot twist that could have been. Particularly so, I think, because it subverts the idea that the player already has about what dying and respawning in a video game is supposed to mean. I spoke to one of the game's programmers, Amelia Von Hayden, who was also really excited by the idea of a hardcore mode in which you need to purchase credits in order to respawn and create a new clone each time. Run out of those credits, and it'd be game over. That sounds really smart. This cloning idea also offered room for a really rather unique ending, which I'm going to have to spoil for you now if I can even spoil a game that never came out. Right, you remember in the gameplay demo when Killian catches a bounty target and wants to send them back to the person paying for the contract. He attaches this device to them and it teleports them away. Well, in the final moments of the game as the war sphere is exploding around you and you're racing to try and escape it in time, you're running and climbing over stuff and you burst through a window and out into space. And at this point, Killian is dying because He's just burst out into space, and so he has no choice but to strap his own capture device to his own body and input random coordinates. He does this, activates it in a last ditch attempt to save his own life, and ends up teleporting back to Earth. The credits roll, and you see what he does with the entire rest of his life. He packs away his bounty hunter gear, 
He finds a wife, has kids, grows old, and eventually passes away peacefully in a hospital bed surrounded by his loved ones. You hear the heartbeat monitor flatline, the screen fades to white, and then you're greeted by the words, Welcome back, Killian, as you wake up once again, inevitably, in that same safe house on Exodus, in the body of yet another clone. I think that's a superb idea. Not only does it sound like a great finale, which I think it does, but it also very elegantly gets around a problem that a lot of open world games face. How do you offer an important, no going back conclusion to your storyline and then let players keep exploring the world afterwards? Plenty of games ask you to load a save file from before the final mission to combat this, but here the Prey 2 team, and I should specifically say a programmer by the name of Norm Nazaroth, had come up with a different kind of solution. One that sounds pretty brilliant. All right, that's the story side of things wrapped up. Let's talk about the gameplay, which is, you know, rather important as well. I've been told that had the team been given enough time, they were confident they'd be able to create a game that for the most part matched the experience promised by the demo we saw in 2011, but also in a number of ways they'd hoped to exceed it. As well as the city we saw in that first gameplay, which was called the Bowery and was kept in constant darkness thanks to the way in which Exodus orbited its sun, there were also two other city hubs of a similar scale. It's not clear whether these would have been the final names, but internally they were being referred to as Lightside, which was a city on the opposite hemisphere to the Bowery, and as the name suggests, was always in daylight. And then there was the Undercity, which was built in a series of caves beneath the planet's surface. You travel between these three cities as part of the core storyline, but there are also plenty of incentives along the way to pick up side objectives and bounties. Now, the bounties were given to you by wanted posters scattered around the world, and on them, the name of the targets, the target's appearance, the difficulty of the bounty, the reward that you'd get for completing it, and the location to go and find them within were all procedurally generated, the idea being that no two bounties should play exactly the same. It was important to Human Head, I'm told, that Killian felt like a hunter here and not just a killer. So when you received a bounty, you may have to chase down some hints or go to an imprecise location on your map to try and find the bounty. There was a, an element of preparation involved. On top of that, some targets would of course be worth more alive, and that actually ties into a feature the team were pretty excited about, which was the action of drawing your character's gun. This was meant to feel significant. So by default, when moving through populated areas, Killian would holster his weapon, which is still a fairly uncommon trait in first-person shooters, it's worth saying, and although you could draw it at any time, this would have an impact on your interactions with other characters. It might start a firefight, or intimidate a target, or perhaps even impress them somehow, depending on the circumstances. The combat itself was meant to feel like it had some real momentum to it. Killian could jump and climb and slide, even while firing his weapon, and in fact, you'd have been encouraged to do this a lot. The team had implemented an adrenaline meter, which filled up as you moved around and clambered over things, rewarding the player with increased accuracy and damage. Staying still and chipping away at enemies from behind cover would put you at a serious disadvantage. Yeah, traversal was meant to be a huge part of playing Prey 2, with its climbing system taking a lot of inspiration from 2008's Mirror's Edge, but combining that with a more involved first-person shooter. There was a feeling within the team that this would lead to a lot of big changes across the industry. You look at the most recent Call of Duty game, you look at Titanfall, and it feels like we were a little bit ahead of our time there, said gameplay programmer Norm Nazaroff. We were doing a lot of this stuff six or seven years ago, and ultimately the industry has gone in that direction. It's just too bad that we didn't get to have it out there first. Nazaroff and his team were playing around with a few different ideas here, like allowing players to vault over an object, but if they kept the climb button held down, they'd flip around in the process and end up in cover on the other side. Or you could do the same thing when approaching a ledge, sliding towards it, and then dropping down and immediately hanging from the other side. All the while, you're meant to be firing your gun and doing damage to your enemies. This was called Agile Combat. On top of that, there was going to be an extensive range of gadgets for Killian to use, around 30 in total. You'll have seen the hover boots in the initial trailer, but there was also a grappling hook, and the two of those combine pretty well when it comes to traversal, as you'd expect. In fact, almost everyone I spoke to from the team referenced the Batman Arkham games in relation to how it felt using those two items getting around Exodus. You could grapple to a point and just get there directly, or slingshot past that point, then use your hover boots to buy enough time to grapple somewhere else. Each gadget also had a number of potential upgrades to consider. The grappling hook, for example, could be improved to allow Killian to pull enemies towards him and then immediately use them as a body shield. There were normal grenades, cluster grenades, anti-gravity grenades, which you could also upgrade to lift people just for a little while and then slam them back into the ground. There were proximity mines and shoulder-mounted rockets, homing missiles, rockets that used a laser guidance system. There was a deployable shield that you drop in front of you at the maximum range of your kick slide. So if you timed everything perfectly, you drop it and then slide into cover in one, fluid movement. 
Killian had a gadget slot on his wrist which you could pop a flamethrower into which as a default fired napalm but you could tweak it to freeze enemies instead and then smash them into tiny pieces. There were melee gadgets from electric fists to laser whips. You could use active camouflage or summon drones to fight alongside you. One version of these drones, by the way, flew around at shoulder height as you might expect, but with another version something went a bit wrong while a developer was working on them and from that point onwards they could only bounce around on the floor as a result. This bug soon became a feature and so Killian could surround himself with these small hopping drones which would then hurtle towards enemies and pummel them to death if, if that's what you wanted to do. Oh, and um, there was also a satellite strike. That one sounded a bit overkill, to be honest. What I'm saying is there were a lot of gadgets. That's not even all of them. Those are just the favourites of the developer that I spoke to. And yeah, interestingly, Human Head wanted you to specialise and you'd pick a loadout and sort of take the gadgets that, that fitted your playstyle best, whereas Bethesda, the publisher, liked the idea that you just have access to all of them at all times once you bought them. So yeah, not sure exactly how that would have gone, but there were lots of gadgets to pick from and some of them sound quite interesting. And that's the thing, isn't it? Prey 2 had what sounds like a lot of ideas going for it, and it's impossible to know how well they would have worked together in practice, of course, but that is also the frustration that we all have with this story, right? We never got the opportunity to find out. Having spoken to various members of the team, it sounds like the game was trying to break a lot of new ground from the way it brought together combat and traversal in a way we're now starting to see in more and more big budget titles to the innovations it promised on a technical front. Here's one for the uh, Digital Foundry fans. Prey 2 was set to be the first and perhaps only game to feature screen space reflections on the last generation of consoles. I'm not entirely sure what that means. It sucks that we never got to play this game, but more than that, it's also really disappointing to think we never saw how its design and its tech could have influenced all the other games that would have followed it. And then there's the human cost too. This game getting cancelled affected people's lives. Of course it did, and in some pretty major ways too. Not only did they lose their work, which is really frustrating, but some people lost their jobs and maybe had to move their families to an entire different state to find employment. Or this team that was working really well together suddenly couldn't as a result of losing this project. And yeah, that stuff is worth remembering too uh, with stories like this. And it's why we want to talk about that tomorrow on Eurogamer. So if you are interested, do come back for that. And... Yeah, until then, thank you very much for watching this week's episode of the Here's a Thing. If you did enjoy it, or if in particular if you enjoyed anything you heard about the ideas that were being worked on for Prey 2, do let us know in the comments below, because I reckon there might be a few developers uh, that would like to hear what you think, and that would be pretty cool. If this is your first time watching Here's a Thing, we do stories like this every two weeks, and there are a couple of recent examples here, including um, the Overwatch balance triangle, and... Uh, XCOM, the original XCOM, was actually cancelled during its development and yet no one told the people making it. That's an interesting one too. Yeah, hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you next time. Goodbye.